morning. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to speak today. And uh, thank you all for coming to uh, listen to this talk. I'm happy to be here and share with you what we've been up to over the last several years. Um, let's see if I can advance my slides there. So some disclosures, uh, some of the work uh, we've done over the years has led to some uh, IP, which uh, part of our goal, as you'll hear in a minute, is, is very translational, trying to move some of these discoveries into clinical practice. And so uh, that does create the necessary financial uh, conflicts along the way. Here are a couple of references. A lot of what I'll talk about in terms of fragmentation patterns and the potential for diagnostics using uh, such analysis uh, has been the subject of two publications from our lab uh, over the last couple of years, both in science translational medicine and one from earlier this year. So, uh, and it's been led by uh, these wonderful people. Uh, well, Marcus here was an undergraduate student when he first started, is now an MD, PhD student at Penn State. Um, and uh, Karen uh, was a postdoctoral computational scientist uh, who has now moved to industry. Uh, Braden and Michelle are still with us. One is a, a lead is the lead computational scientist in the lab. The other one uh, is uh, pursuing her master's going from lab to computation. So you can see sort of there's a trend emerging in our in our group here where we try to push people uh, towards uh, being a little bit of both. Here's the outline for today's talk. I'll talk a little bit about, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction of our program, um, background of self-free DNA analysis, um, and then um, hopefully try to convince you that fragmentation patterns we see in self-free DNA are, are not completely random. Um, how we use them as biomarkers, uh, or potentially could use them as biomarkers, um, expand that a little bit further, and then end with uh, what we've seen so far in trying to do that uh, in across large cohorts. So let's get into it. Just as introduction for my lab, uh, we are very much a translational diagnostics development program. We're in the business of developing genomics-enabled cancer diagnostics. What that means is very often the questions we ask uh, start somewhere between a clinical gap we recognize in practice and the opportunity using some sort of minimally invasive uh, genomics tool or approach. And we very much thrive at identifying such opportunities at, at, at this sort of intersection of application and uh, genomics tools and methods and computational tools. Uh, and we try to sort of then adapt tools and develop assays both using bench tricks and computational tricks to try and go address that gap. Uh, and biomarker development very often follows then uh, this pattern where you, whatever you have come up with, you'd like to perform some sort of analytical validation on it, really make sure it's measuring what you think it's measuring, move on, demonstrate some relevance in a clinical scenario, and then biomarkers will then move on to retrospective and prospective clinical validation, and hopefully someday become part of a clinical trial. We very much thrive at the first part of this uh, cycle where uh, we'd like to tinker with computational molecular tools, try and address these gaps, demonstrate proof of principle, and hopefully hand over to our clinical colleagues who can then take these fo things forward into larger uh, clinical studies. More specifically, uh, the subject of our research is um, plasma um, cell-free DNA or cell-free DNA in general. And to introduce that topic, Consider a blood sample you take from any individual. If you spin it down and you remove the cells, you're left with plasma. We've known for close to seven decades now that outside of cells in plasma, there are fragments of DNA that are circulating around. These tend to be short fragments. And for about a couple of decades, we've realized that actually, if you took this blood sample from a pregnant mother, then a fraction of that DNA is contributed by the fetus. And so this was what led to a lot of diagnostic development in what is now known as non-invasive prenatal diagnostics. Um, and analogously, if you've now taken the blood sample from a cancer patient, a fraction of this DNA is actually cancer specific. And the way you know it's cancer specific, and I'll refer to this as you know, tumor DNA or circulating tumor DNA, CT DNA for short, the way you know it's tumor specific more conventionally is because it carries the same somatic genomic alterations you would typically find in the tumor biopsy. And so whether it's point mutations or rearrangements, potentially amplifications or deletions from across the genome, so more or less of the DNA in some parts of the genome, or even epigenetic changes. This field over the last, I would say 10, 15 years has really uh, 
exploded in interest. Uh, when I first started working in this area, uh, we were laughed off and uh, there was never going to be enough DNA in plasma. There was never going to be enough DNA to actually, this was a time where you needed a microgram of DNA to do whole genome sequencing. Um, that time is long gone. Uh, and uh, you know we were right at the cusp of where we had about 10 nanograms. I'll get into a little bit of that. And we were trying to do these big things in genomics. But really, the potential applications of circulating tumor DNA analysis really span the spectrum of needs in what, what you need for a cancer patient, all the way from imagine a patient who is either pre-symptomatic or has presented with early stage disease through somebody who has metastatic cancer or has progression of their metastatic cancer. The applications really range from an advanced cancer patient, you're trying to see if their tumor carries a certain mutation, so-called tumor genotyping to an early stage patient where you've just treated them for disease, either you're trying to detect disease in the first place, which is early detection, or you've just treated them for disease and you're trying to establish, is there anything left behind? So-called residual disease detection. What is interesting though, is if you consider the y-axis now on this, uh, on this uh, cartoon, the y-axis is built on log scale. And what it really represents is how different tumor fraction can be in plasma across these settings. So while in advanced cancer cases where today, actually, if you wanted to do a blood-based genotyping assay, there are several commercially available. This isn't something, this is way outside, in the space of 10 years, this has gone from re pure research that nobody thought would work to there are five companies out there that offer this as a commercial test today, right? But you can see how tumor fractions being somewhere in the 1% or higher area in a, in a, in a blood sample help that very much. It's easy to pick up these tumor mutations. When you start to go to earlier applications, early detection, residual disease detection, tumor fraction can actually be two, sometimes three orders lower. And that's where a lot of our current work is now, has now focused. Now, if you take a 10 mil blood sample, you generally get about four milliliters of plasma after spinning it down. And in a normal healthy person, Typically, this, this amount of plasma will yield about 20 nanograms of total DNA, of plasma DNA, which we've come to think of many of these things in haploid genome copies. So 3.3 picograms per haploid genome, this is about 6,000 copies of the genome. Why is this important? Remember, tumor fraction on the high end is about 1%, which for a single mutation now is already 60 fragments only in this entire blood sample. That's assuming you have a perfectly efficient assay. Everything goes well, you lose no DNA along the way, and you can pick up every one of those 60 fragments, which is never true in any, I can definitely tell you it's not true in sequencing library preps for sure. It's not true in many biological assays. But as you push that tumor fraction down and you consider this sort of localized breast cancer at presentation, you already have a tumor fraction of about 0.1%. You're dealing with a few fragments, some of which you may pick and some of which you might not. As patients get treatment, these fractions become even lower. And so a lot of the challenge actually stems from the fact that there's very limited amount of DNA available, and you're trying to do a lot from a limited DNA. Why, why is this important? The reason it's important is if you have two fragments in a sample, in one blood tube, you have two fragments, the chance that the next blood tube or the one before it will actually have no fragments for that mutation is pretty high, right? They're looking at a Poisson process, and it's really just sampling noise now. There's various ways people look at this and try to get over it. And you know, this is sort of where a lot of the field started off looking into the depths of the sample. How can I get every last fragment from my, for my locus of interest, right? So example here is you have one mutation, let's say you have an amazing PCR-based assay for that one mutation. You want to get every last fragment that represents that locus in that sample. So that's about 6,000 fragments. We and others have done some work that I won't talk about today, but sort of start saying, okay, why only look at one mutation from this patient? Could we look at 100 together? Because now, from the same blood sample, I can actually assay 600,000 fragments and see if any representation of that cancer is present in the, in the tube. And so the way you would do this is, you know, either there are recurrent mutations, mutations you know about, gene panels, methylation changes, et cetera. But what's interesting and what, how, where the field has moved quite a bit now is, sure, that's what happens if you look deep. But what happens if you look wide? What happens if you look across the genome? And suddenly the number of observations changes, right? Because now just one X whole genome sequencing, which is very cheap and easy to generate data for now, is already 18 million fragments. I'll talk about a little bit about fragment size in a little bit, but 
It's many, many more observations, but what do you do with those observations? And so people have done various things. You could look at their abundance across the genome, so-called copy number alterations that are being driven by the tumor's contribution. You could look at hundreds and thousands of mutations in aggregate, right? Why look at 100? Why not look at 5,000 mutations from across the genome? Or you could look at methylation sites similarly. What we've begun to focus on, and I'll talk a little bit more about, are these fragmentation patterns um, that seem to have some uh, information as well. So that was that introduction. One, one thing that we've recognized over several um, years now, ever since the uh, early parts of the field, is that if you take this blood sample, this plasma DNA sample, and perform whole genome sequencing, you can do this with whole genome sequencing. You can do this with any, any electrophoretic assay, to be fair. Um, and look at the fragment size distribution in this sample. It tends to have this very characteristic distribution. There are 15 overlaid gray lines from individual samples on this plot, and the red is the, is the mean. The mode of this distribution, this fragment length distribution, is very much at 167 base pairs over and over and over again. And for some of you, this will remind you of the length of DNA that is wrapped around in a single nucleosome plus a little bit of the linker region, a 20 base pair linker region. It turns out that if you look at regions of the genome where nucleosome positioning is highly conserved across multiple different cell types, you actually see these oscillations in plasma cell-free DNA coverage, the period of which is about 180 to 200 base pairs. And they seem to coincide very well with what we know about where nucleosomes are protecting DNA from degradation there, or where nucleosomes are positioned inside cells. And so this has led to this idea that what you see in plasma isn't completely degraded. It's under attack by nucleases, but it's being protected intermediately by these by association into mononucleosomes, essentially. And while this observation has been around for a while, we actually recently looked for what would this look like in urine cell-free DNA. Urine cell-free DNA has been traditionally known to be more degraded and more chopped up. And what struck us very well just with this first basic experiment was, once again, the 30 gray lines from individual urine samples from different individuals overlaid here. And it turns out that this distribution is different from plasma, but seems to have modes, the highest one of which is at, a, at 81 base pairs, which happens to be just about the length of DNA you would find protected in a tetramer rather than an octamer. And then the next one tends to be at about 110 base pairs. That one, if you look into literature, seems to be just about as much that would be protected in a hexamer, suggesting that there is ongoing degradation going on in this, in this environment um, as, the, as, the, as the DNA is being cleared into urine. What's interesting, though, is this idea that coverage is conserved and is related to where originally the nucleosomes were placed in the contributing cells in the first place seems to hold. We still see coverage oscillations that very much match what we see in blood, especially in, for example, this chromosome 12 region with highly conserved nucleosome positions across different cell types. Just to press this a little bit further, and I'm going to make sort of some cursory mentions of this, there's more detail in here, and I'm happy to talk about it if, there, if people are interested. When you look at different regions and different features of the genome where you know chromatin accessibility is different. So in this case, look at a lymphoblastoid cell line where open and closed chromatin is well annotated based on a variety of different analyses. What you tend to find is in open chromatin regions, plasma DNA fragments tend to be shorter on average compared to closed chromatin regions. Again, suggesting that chromatin accessibility has something to do with how this DNA is being protected in the first place. We made similar observations in urine, although this is a lymphoblastoid cell line, and this, you know, the effect is there, but it's, it's shifted and it's a different size profile because, again, urine cell free DNA is shorter in general. But you can look at it not in one cell line, but across multiple cell lines. In this case, we use DNA's hypersensitivity uh, data from published cell lines and use our healthy plasma and urine samples to really go across the genome in 500 KB bins and sort of say, is this open chromatin or is this closed chromatin? And is this DNA, is DNA in this particular window generally above the median size or below the median size? It's really just to see, is there any association between any of this? Turns out when you do that for plasma DNA, 
the strongest association that you find between whether DNA is protected or not, and whether the whether the cell whether the region is annotated as open or closed, actually comes forth with lymphoid and myeloid cells, suggesting that's perhaps where most of this DNA is coming from. Very well in alignment with other ways of showing this in literature. But when you do the same thing with, for urine, the cells that win out are actually epithelial and renal epithelial cells, suggesting that the sources may be different. And yes, there is some information that's conserved just in how DNA is being fragmented in the first place. Another way to do this is there's a certain region of the genome called the transcription start site. And for highly expressed genes, you will actually find nucleosome depletion in that region, suggesting that, again, if, the gene, if, G, if a gene is being expressed highly in the cell that's shedding DNA, you'd expect that region of the genome to not have as many cell free DNA fragments compared to genes that are not as well expressed. We're not the first ones to show this, but just to see, just to confirm that we see the same thing, we actually see that in plasma and we see something similar in urine. And again, pushing it just one step further in correlation, when we compare what genes show up in plasma and what genes show up in urine, the genes that show up in urine tend to be the ones that are whose expression is better observed in epithelial, renal epithelial cells as opposed to lymphoid and myeloid cells of the, of the blood. All of this is to say fragmentation isn't random at all in what you see in plasma and urine. I think that's all I would take from here. I wouldn't necessarily say, hey, this must be the cell type or that must be the cell type. I think what we're really seeing is there is you know, a pattern of degradation that is driven by what cell is shedding DNA. And why is that important for us? We're in the business of biomarker development in cancer. And so where we wanna take this is this idea of, okay, in a patient with cancer, DNA is being shed by cancer cells. Is there anything about how it's being degraded differently that we could use as a biomarker? And that's where we've really taken this in our lab. So how do we go about doing that? Jay Shandiri's lab in 2016 published this interesting uh, way of looking at this, um, where, again, remember that you're seeing a lot of the DNA seems to be mononucleosomal in size. You see that it seems the representation is better where nucleosome protection is present. Could we actually go backwards? Could we look at a plasma DNA sample and try to infer where it's being protected better versus not? And the way this works is you essentially look at each locus, each window across the genome, and you look at the number of fragments that span that window. So for example, this gray window, number of fragments that span that window versus number of fragments that break within that window. And that leads to this window protection score concept. And now suddenly you've got this, um, you know, this quantitative metric that as you go across the genome goes up and down, depending on where you're seeing evidence of protection or not. Plug that into your favorite peak calling algorithm, and you've suddenly got several million peaks from across the genome that are essentially windows of protection in a given set of samples. The original paper did this in four different sets of samples. We added a fifth set of 15 healthy samples. We did this in urine samples from multiple in multiple sets as well. And on the left, what you see is when you compare any two such maps, which has millions of peaks, there is about a 70 to 80% overlap between these maps, especially in plasma. The overlap is not very strong when you go urine versus plasma, but some reasons for that I alluded to earlier on. What's interesting is for each of these maps, the interpeak distance is generally about 200 base pairs. That's, and then you know, and there's other peaks further down on that distribution. And when you overlay these maps on top of each other, overlay these peaks on top of each other, the distance between adjacent peaks tends to be predominantly zero, suggesting most of these peaks are actually quite conserved regardless of what sample set you look at or whether we've done this or somebody else, somebody else has sequenced this. So all of this is to say these recurrently protected regions we observe in plasma seem remarkably conserved. This is just on the left is just yet another way of, of showing that. We've done this in, you know, we made a map based on 17 healthy individuals and then we kind of did bootstrapping to remove one at a time to see how does the map change. And most of these maps, as you would imagine, actually agree very well with each other. But what's more interesting is that this is not, you know, this is millions of regions. They're not necessarily driven by one region of the genome. 
there's millions of windows, not driven by one region of the genome. You know, you look across different chromosomes, you see a fairly similar distribution uh, in every one, one MB window uh, across the genome. When you overlay these windows on top of each other and see where fragments lie now from a different set of samples, you actually tend to see that fragment starts and ends clustered towards the periphery of that protected window. Should not be a surprise by this point. The number of ways we've shown you these windows are conserved, this is the way it should be working. It's good to see that it does. When you do the same thing for urine, you see it's actually not as well protected, but again, that should not be a surprise either. You see these peaks on the periphery, but then you don't see as much protection as you go into the, into the middle. But all of this led us to this hypothesis, which is if you've inferred a number of these peaks, if you've inferred this map from a bunch of healthy individuals where you know nucleosome positions are conserved and they're sort of being reflect, uh, reflecting what hematological cells have on average in their in their uh, you know in their DNA and what are, what is being shed into their plasma, could you then measure how often are fragments breaking in the wrong unexpected places? These so-called aberrant fragments, and would that potentially be a biomarker of cancer cells shedding DNA into their blood? And so, why would this work? Right? Why would why would why should this be the case? Well, there could be a number of things that could be driving this. Right? One was this idea that our cancer cells, we know cancer cells are more actively replicating. Do they have greater chromatin accessibility across their genome? And as they turn over and as they die, is this DNA just more randomly fragmented? That's one explanation, potentially. The other could be, is there some tissue specific differences, right? Somebody, a patient has a lung cancer and lung epithelium isn't what generally sheds DNA into plasma. And suddenly it's now shedding DNA into plasma because there is this mass that's growing very rapidly and there's lots of cell turnover and so on. Could we capture that? And similarly, I mean, you know, it could be tissue specific differences in nucleosome positioning, but related to gene expression differences in, in, in tissues as well. And you could further ask the question, is that a difference between tissue types or is that a difference between cancer and healthy? various ways to ask this question. Any number of explanations, the real question we were asking was, if you looked across the genome and you looked at, at the number of fragments or the fraction of fragments that was aberrant, breaking in the wrong places, would that be a biomarker? So the way you would do this is for each particular window, you could basically look across that window, right? This is sort of one recurrently protected region we've identified from a set of millions. How many fragments sort of span that completely, how many fragments have one or more ends within that, and then how many are sort of completely unrelated, right? Like where there is no nearby window, so you can't really tell anything. And you can use that to calculate aberrant fragmentation, and there's a bit of math that goes into accounting for the fact that some of these maybe GC um, content or the fragment size itself affects how often you are, you know, or how likely you are to be within a window or across a window and so on and so forth. So there's some math that goes into it, which I We'll spare you the details off right now. But when we first did this, and this is sort of the striking figure that then took us in, in, in this direction a little bit further. This is hundreds of samples from advanced metastatic cancer patients. It's not quite relevant what cancer type, there's two or three different cancer types in here. And on the x-axis is tumor fraction measured using a copy number based assay. Well validated, we know how that works. On the y-axis is this fragmentation score. You know, you can ignore the terminology uh, exactly used, but think of this as you know the fraction of aberrant fragments, a fragmentation score that we calculated. This correlation was striking. Tumor fractions higher, aberrant fragmentation scores are higher. Tumor fraction is lower, aberrant fragmentation scores are lower. So I said, okay, at a cohort level, maybe there's something interesting going on here. What happens at an individual level? And again, these are two individual patients that I'm showing each panel. The lower panel is the tumor fraction and how it changes over clinical days of follow-up. And the shaded areas is when the patient is receiving some sort of therapy. And so, for example, look at the first patient. They start receiving some sort of therapy. Their tumor fraction drops, which we've known in the field for a long time. What's interesting is that their fragmentation scores drop and they seem to be in step with tumor fraction. 
you can do this more formally and look at sort of across, I think this is almost a dozen patients in this, in this plot where we've looked at plasma samples where we have at least two time points where we know what the tumor fraction change was. And we look at the corresponding aberrant fragmentation change. And you can see one goes up, the other goes up, one goes down, the other goes down across this, across this small set of patients. So already we were thinking, looks like something that's being driven by the tumor, right? A biomarker that's actually being driven by the tumor, but we wanted to push it a little bit further. So we did a little bit more formal work with this, which is in cancer, one of the somatic genomic alterations is copy number alterations. What that means is that there are certain regions of the genome that are gained, there are certain regions of the genome that are lost, and others are copy number neutral. If you say a cancer cell is shedding DNA into plasma, by definition, it is shedding more DNA from the gained regions versus the lost regions, versus the neutral regions versus the lost regions. If this was being driven even in part by cancer, you would expect that the fragmentation score for the gained regions would be generally higher versus the neutral regions versus the lost regions. This is summarizing this data again from 27 different samples from 27 different patients, you know, all put together uh, into, into one figure here for simplicity. And then finally, you could push this even one step further, right? Wouldn't that mean that a mutated fragment on average would have a higher fragmentation score than a non-mutated fragment? But if, because a mutated fragment would really have come from a cancer cell. You know that for sure, because it's the same fragment where you measure the ends of that fragment. And you know this fragment can carries the mutation. And so we did that in a couple of samples. This is more difficult to do, obviously, because you need much more sequencing. This is data from two samples with patients uh, from patients with melanoma. Uh, where we had hundreds of mutations across the genome that we could look at, and we sequenced these samples 300x. So we could really tell across all mutated fragments and at the same loci, non-mutated fragments, that in fact, fragmentation scores were higher for mutated fragments. All of this suggests that what we're measuring is potentially being contributed by the tumor. It could be a very effective biomarker. But how stable are these across healthy individuals anyway? How stable are these fragmentation scores? Could you actually just, you know, are two people so different anyway that it doesn't matter that tumor is contributing a fraction of it? So we looked at that. As you can imagine, reviewers asked for that as well, as they should. Um, so we looked at all of our healthy individuals. So some of these are some of these are samples we've generated. Some of these are from uh, literature where we grouped them into different age groups. And it turned out that their fragmentation scores were actually not very different from each other. We looked across genders, and those fragmentation scores were also not very different. You can keep doing this, right? Took this, we took blood tubes that are paired, so three different blood tubes, three different kinds of blood tubes, right? Processed completely independently, whole genome libraries were prepared. And again, within these healthy individuals, there was no significant difference between these. And if you compare any two of these, you can actually see that they are very, very highly correlated with each other. What if you took a blood tube and extracted it two different ways? There is ever so slight a significant difference if you have enough depth, right? So, but the effect size of that difference is very, very small. And again, they're very highly correlated whether you extract one way or another. And then finally, for those who are interested in next generation sequencing, this is a this is a favorite question. How often do you see the same results in your next sequencing run? And actually, we tried that. And Again, very, very highly correlated. There is a systematic difference here, which in retrospect could be explained by slight differences in beat cleanup between the two libraries. And so again, you know, can there be differences across preps? Yes, but those differences don't seem to be very large. And why is all of that important? When we looked at several hundred plasma samples, some of which we had generated data from, some of which data was available, whole genome sequencing data was available in literature. And we combine these different results together. When we look across healthy samples that we have in our cohort or healthy samples that you know, a group at Hopkins has published from or healthy samples that a group in Hong Kong has published from, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference in these fragmentation scores across these completely entirely independent cohorts from each other. There still doesn't seem to be any significant elevation in fragmentation scores if you look at plasma from patients with benign liver diseases in this case, patients with cirrhosis, patients with hepatitis B. 
Yet, when you start looking across different cancer types, you start seeing these elevations and fragmentation spores. This is all sort of bringing all of that together. All of the data that we showed, one sample at a time or a few samples at a time, you can actually see across the cohort that fragmentation scores are elevated in, in patients with cancer across different stages. And by itself, just this one number we generate for every sample seems to be a fairly effective biomarker, more than I would have thought, right? This isn't great. This isn't what you would use for early detection, right? This is about the vertical line here is about 95% specificity. So what is this about? Maybe approaching 50% sensitivity if you, if you really squint on the right side, right? So, but better than what you'd expect for just a single number you generate from some whole genome sequencing data from across the board. And so at this stage, we started looking for other ways to capture this effect, right? Is there another way? Is there another way of measuring this fragmentation bias or fragmentation difference between healthy and cancer to take this forward? And so this brings me to the this role of nucleotide frequencies. One thing that I completely skipped over is actually if you look at plasma DNA from across the genome and look at what the preferences of different nucleotides are. are on their five prime end, you can actually see, this is labeled to be confusing, I'm sorry, but you can actually see that the first base here that I'm pointing to and the second base here have a strong preponderance for Cs. And that actually has been in literature and been a lot of work by Professor Dennis Lowe and a few others has been related to the preferred ends that DNA is one like three, which is an enzyme active in plasma leads, uh, like switch on. We did this on both ends, only in retrospect. This is a published figure, but sometimes you realize these things in retrospect, only to, in retrospect to realize that actually if you do double standard library preps, for those of you who have actually done that, end polishing means that you only really preserve information from the five prime end. So there's a, I'm sure some of you have done this. The first step is end polishing before you do ligation. And what that really does is if there's a three prime overhang, it chops it up. And if there is a five prime overhang, it fills the three prime end in on the other strand. And so all the information preserved here is just for the five prime end. All you're looking at on the, on the other end of the fragment is essentially, you can see these Gs on the other side as you go inwards, right? So it's, it's essentially a reflection of it on the other strand. So we'll consider most of this data from the five prime end. What's interesting is when you start looking in urine, we actually saw, we did not see that C you know, uh, preference. We actually saw a T preference, which, based on everything we know in literature is actually the favorite base for, or, or the favorite mark of DNA is one, which is an enzyme that wouldn't be able to cut DNA up if it was completely wrapped up in um, nucleosomes and are not available for degradation. And so enzymes have different preferences, they have different expressions, and we can see some evidence of that in, in plasma versus urine, as you could see in the size distribution. This is just to say nuclear frequencies that we are observing are not completely random to begin with. What's interesting is we try to sort of take this, these two things together and see if we could actually make something out of it. What we argued was if DNA is fragmenting in different places across the genome, then in aggregate, which nucleotides are available or which nucleotides are represented at a sample level on the five prime end should show some deviation. Could we actually use that deviation as a potential biomarker? And so this, the way this works is you have a fragment that's mapped to the reference genome. Let's just consider the left side here. You look at the positions for each fragment. Again, this is not on the fragment. This is basically from the reference genome. You look at the positions for each fragment where the left end is mapped or the where the five prime end is mapped. You take those positions, see what basis it represents, and you add that up across the entire genome. And so for every such position, now you're left with one set of four frequencies right, A, C's, G's, and T's. And so across the genome now, you let's say you have these 21 positions, including the first uh, position here, and you have some set of frequencies. It turns out that we looked at a whole bunch of plasma samples from cancer patients. These frequencies were not very random at all. You could see that they were well correlated. Some of these positions were better correlated with fragmentation scores in the first place than others. At the time, we made the argument that 
maybe what we're capturing is the difference in the genomic positioning that is being contributed by the cancer. Some work we've done since actually now looks at this in terms of randomness. You look at the first position or the second position, and that's what you see on the, on the left here, the inside first or the inside second and the inside third. And you start to see that cancer oftentimes just has a more random composition. It's closer to one fourth of everything, right? A, C, G, and T, as opposed to preferring some base away from that randomness. So this is explorations that are on going as of the last few weeks, and we're sort of still trying to make sense of where do we take this and how do we, uh, how do we uh, move this forward. But there is some information in here that I think uh, we can now begin to capture. Thinking about combining all of this together. So I showed you what fragmentation scores alone could do. We've actually looked at these multiple nucleotide frequencies in different positions. We use three of those positions, the first position inside the fragment and the two positions outside the fragment. And it turned out that combining all of these things together, we could actually do better than fragmentation scores alone. That's the light blue line in here. Uh, again, based on a random forest model. So you allow it to make different decisions given those three positions and nucleotide frequencies that were measured there. But we combine all of that together and suddenly our performance becomes far more impressive. Now we're looking at a model that can classify a plasma sample from a stage one, two, or three the stages that are relevant, cancer patient from a healthy individual with remarkable accuracy. Again, at 95% specificity, the sensitivity is approaching about 70%, starting to become a little bit relevant. And it seems like this effect is actually, you know, a little bit dependent on what stage of cancer you're looking at. So earlier stage cancers will obviously have, you know, smaller amounts of DNA shedding from them and, and will be more difficult to detect. What's remarkable also is we started to ask the question, how much sequencing do we really need, right? So far I've talked about whole genome sequencing. It sounds like very expensive business. If you're doing $1,000 of whole genome sequencing per sample, this would actually be a very difficult test to perform. It turns out that the fragmentation scores, as well as the nucleotide frequencies, because we measure all of this, it's a, it's a, it's a coin flip, right? It's either aberrant or it's not, and it's one fraction. Similarly, nuclear frequencies, you have four options. These things saturate really quickly at a genome-wide level. And so the signal actually saturates very, very quickly. So when you go from 10 million reads per sample to about 5 million reads per sample to up to a million reads per sample, the coefficient of variation for fragmentation scores is not actually changing very much. And similarly, when you run this whole machine learning model that I just showed you, with just a million reads per sample, as opposed to 10 million reads per sample, it doesn't seem to bother at all. And just to put all of this into context, again, sequencing platforms will vary and how you design your experiment will vary, but, two million, but a million reads is $2 worth of sequencing per sample. So at this point, to do most of this work in our lab, it's actually more expensive to extract the DNA and prepare the sequencing library than the sequencing data itself. Right. So we've, of course, you know, started thinking about how do we address some of these other challenges to really make this more cost effective. So I'm going to summarize everything I've told you, and I'll just highlight a few next steps. I'm happy to, happy to invite questions and discussion. I'm sure there's several ideas you guys have about, about what we could do better. So what I've shown you today is that fragmentation patterns in cell-free DNA and plasma and urine appear non-random, and they seem to be influenced by contributing cells and tissues. Analysis of aberrant fragmentation seems, it seems possible that we can leverage this as a biomarker for cancer detection and response monitoring. It seems to be robust to multiple pre-analytical factors, and there appears to be some signal in nucleotide frequencies surrounding fragment ends. And then finally, in the very at the very end, I was talking about how it requires limited sampling and sequencing coverage for what the area we see where it could be most useful is cost-effective cancer detection in resource-limited settings, where a $1,000 a test is not an option, where you need something like a $50 a test or $20 a test or less. And that's the direction we're trying to push some of this into. But there, of course, are many, many unanswered questions. For this audience, perhaps one question that could be of most interest is, 
how many people have we really looked at in terms of our health? These right, we're looking at 15 people here, 20 people there. What's the differences across genetic backgrounds? And there's some evidence in literature, although it's very early to suggest that if you have, for example, a p53 mutation or a BRCA1 mutation, fragmentation patterns in cell-free DNA look completely different from a normal healthy individual, even without the diagnosis of cancer. And so what does that mean? Where is that coming from? We don't know. We're asking that question. Again, model performance for overall cancer detection is impressive, but this has been a retrospective convenience cohort. How does it vary across different tumor types? I didn't talk about that at all. And also, is there a way to make the calculation more cancer-specific in some way? Could we look at some parts of the genome, some regions that are more accessible or less accessible in certain tissue types and change the way we calculate our score. And that's an area of, of ongoing interest in work in our lab. You could also argue that are there acute changes in pathophysiology? I don't know, a trauma patient, somebody with acute infection, somebody who runs five flights of stairs before they give you the sample. Could that change something that we measure here? It doesn't appear that way, at least in these healthy individuals, but as, as sampling biases go, healthy individuals are probably uber healthy in this cohort, right? So we need to, we need to look, look into that. We're also asking this interesting question, how limited a sample can we work with and how much lower can we drive the cost? So I talked about cost a little bit, but if you only need a billion reads, that, that, that's about just under 0.1x of a haploid genome. So a haploid genome is 3.3 picograms. Suddenly we're starting to look at amount of plasma DNA we could potentially get from a blood drop. And so we're really exploring that now is sort of seeing, okay, if we have different types of dried blood spots, could we actually get some of this information from there? Because that could change what we can do here. And then finally, nucleotide frequencies. I talked about this a little bit, you know, after, after a few months of, of doing this and after the paper came out, we scratched our heads and sort of said, okay, what about the three prime end of the fragment? Because all we got was the five prime end. And so, some of you may be aware that single-stranded DNA library preps have started to become far more accessible than they were until recently. Over the last few months, there are a couple of commercial providers that are allowing you to uh, make single-stranded libraries where you would preserve both ends. So we're starting to look into that and, and, and develop that further. The last slide before acknowledgments is just to share this view that I talked a little bit about point mutations and what people were doing in the beginning, these somatic genomic alterations. That was the way we looked at cell-free DNA. And then I sort of took you through this exercise of what if you started looking at less tumor-specific things and more tumor-derived things? And that's sort of how the field has evolved, right? We've started going from we are the best biomarker because we are so tumor-specific. Turns out point mutations aren't all that tumor-specific anyway. But that that is a side conversation, right? We've started to look at tumor derived targets a lot more. How do how does the genome fragment? How does methylation change? Maybe even how does the patient's microbiome change? Or how does the representation of exosomes or mitochondrial DNA change when a patient has cancer? And can we use all of that as a potential biomarker? And so the field has gone through this evolution and we're sort of in this space where we're looking at less tumor specific things and clearly hoping that clever computational stat strategies and computational analysis strategies will help us overcome some of those challenges as we tried to show in this one example. With that, I'll stop. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to take questions. And uh, if there's any interest in working in any of these areas, please let me know. And I have all of these wonderful people in my lab, uh, many of my collaborators. Translational science is, uh, is a team sport, I'll tell you that. It takes a lot all the way from imagining a study, getting it approved, enrolling a patient, making sure the samples are appropriately collected, going through the molecular and computational analysis and, and all the way back then making sense of that information. But it's been a fun few years and uh, really very much enjoy this work. Thanks to all these people we get to work with. Thank you. Yes. Well, what I'm doing here is the biological split spectrum. I got um, a simple question. Turns out there are, we couldn't know what the cancer is to what it is. But it's probably a big difference between bloodborne cancer samples and uh, the solid tumor. 
And even within the solid tumors, well, well, it's just the statistic. But I have the solid tumors of that whole way over here, easy to easy to dismiss. But these blood borne maybe not so much. What are the comments on the statistics? So depending on the approach you're using, it can actually be the other way around from what you are what you're saying, right? So I think what's interesting about this is a lot of this approach that I've described so far is essentially looking at differences from healthy, right? And some of those differences are actually perhaps not driven by cancer at all. They're just driven by the fact that it's a different tissue type that's contributing the DNA in the first place, right? And when you look at it from that lens, most of the DNA that's coming in plasma from healthy individuals is actually hematological cells. Therefore, it stands to reason that hematological malignancies will be a little bit more difficult to detect, right? You mentioned that earlier. Okay, so coming back to so what happens to solid tumors? So a lot of the data that I presented today is all solid tumors. Most of our work has been in solid tumors, and it seems like there's a lot to be able to, to find there. What is interesting is that outside of very deep sequencing in a very selected few samples, where we can really say these patterns are being driven by this gene expression program somehow, right? Or they're associated with this particular cell type. At this level, at the level that we are generating this data at, we can see deviation from expected, but we can't quite put our finger on deviation from a put related to a particular cell type yet. But but we do see lots of deviation. So in samples where tumor fractions are high, we can tell a lot. And those tumor fractions can be sometimes, I mean, in the highest tumor fractions we have seen, we've actually seen as much as 50, 60% of the plasma DNA coming from the solid tumor, which is at that point as good as a, you know, a tumor biopsy sample, right? There it's easy. When the tumor fractions are low, even despite the amplification, it can be very low, right? Because you're now talking about an area where one in every 10,000 fragments is from the tumor. That is generally the early detection space you'd like to go for, right? One in 1,000 to one in 10,000. At that point, it's still pretty challenging, but there's ways to go forward. And I think we're seeing some evidence that it's promising. Are there ways to make this even more sensitive? That's the pursuit at the moment. Yeah. Yes. So last time I tried to do cell-free RNA, it turned out that it was degraded down to, at least in our hands, down to about 20 base pair fragments, which made it really challenging. So to be fair, just like I talked about single standard DNA preps and you know just the evolution of um, library preparation tools and preservation tools and so on and so forth, which is what's driven a lot of the field forward. I haven't looked in that space in a few years since. There um, are metrics that are optimized to small RNAs, you can usually focus in on things that are in cells, but I, I didn't think that would be an insurmountable barrier. Yeah, I think in our hands, it became very challenging to use at least mRNA that's fragmented that small to be able to make sense of that information at that at the time. Again, I know Munish, uh, Manish Tiwari, I think that's his name, from Michigan and others have actually come up with tools to work with mRNA and again, adapted some of those small RNA tools and sort of seen what you could do there. I haven't seen something that's changed sort of tax completely or changed the field completely yet, but I'm sure there is there is a potential to include that. Steve. Great talk. You had... Um... The AUC dropping down for stage four from stage three, do you think that's because of sort of stochastic effects on fragmentation processes for more advanced cancers? Do you think? Yeah, no, I think what it no, I think what this shows you is that the different tumor types and the different stages are not equally well represented in a, in this entire cohort. This is a very this is very much a convenience cohort, right? You're looking at some of these data we we generated, some of these data others generated, and we kind of put it all together. And so you suddenly start to see 
this is where if you wanted to, if you really want me to drill into stage by stage or tumor type by tumor type, this isn't the data set, right? The right place to do this is a well-collected, well-representative sort of data set of a single tumor type or a few tumor types where you've done this well. So I wouldn't read too, too much into it quite yet. Any um, any thoughts on incorporating methylation as an additional feature to capture hypomethylation cancers? I think I think I think there's parallels in my response to that and 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 uh, and uh, RNA and perhaps that is my bias to be fair of how easy this is to do right now right this is just it's just so simple you're taking a blood sample you're preparing a whole genome library and you're getting two million reads at this point. This is really easy to do, right? The computational analysis is doing most of the tricks, right? There are ways people have in incorporated fragmentation with methylation in a way that sort of looks at where, so, so remember if DNA is one like three is the enzyme that's cutting these C positions with the preference, it probably matters whether the C is methylated or not. And there's recent literature that captures that phenomena and demonstrates that actually whether you see fragmentation at a certain C or not has something to do with whether that C is methylated in the in the first place or not. And so there's various ways to incorporate that together, but I'm sure there's more, more signal there. Yes. The follow up to both of those is you're mapping to a reference genome to get, generate your distribution of bases. Could you use reference genome proportion methylated as another character state? So that, um, sure. You could. We haven't tried, but you could, yeah. Potentially, yeah. I mean, again, I don't know the answer to whether it'll work or not, and I think we'll find out, right? Um, I mean, I think even in this case, even in the DNA case, I think what we haven't done, and others have done this, where they've looked at Kamer preference at the ends and not just nucleotide preference at the end, right? And you could sort of, I think the, the upside of this, if it works equally well, is that you have, again, it's four ways your data can fall at that location, and so it saturates pretty quickly. Once you start building in additional sort of longer instances, then now you have many options and you may have more noise in very, very low, you know. Again, there's some argument to be made about, do you, should you actually aim for 2 million reads? I mean, if a million reads is $2 and 10 million reads is, you know, I don't know, $10, then are we like now starting to optimize for something that doesn't really matter in the long run, right? Because the patient has to go give a blood sample, and in this country, that alone will cost something. So, how does that work? Oh. Well, right now, you're, you're kind of moving away from uh, point mutation and Mendel, but could you combine the uh, the average fragment with uh, a score on you know the quality of the match, you know the fragments that contain Mendel's or something, and get a little bit additional special specificity there with Enough data and enough number of mutations you could go after, yes. I mean, I think people, what, what they've been, so there's a couple of different ways to do this, right? If you know where to look for those mutations, you know those mutations exist in the patient's tumor in the first place. Now, you have just like kind of raw score, you know, number of fragments that contain an indel. So, you know, or average fragments that contain an indel. So, so that takes us into a space which is very much fraught with variant calling errors. Right, it, it takes us into that space. Although that's not to say that people haven't tried to do that, and there there are library prep tricks you could use um, as so both again molecular identifiers, other things you could do potentially to do that, or simply you could model where those errors happen in the first place, and people have tried that as well. Right, where do these errors happen in the first place in the genome, or what what does it look like? What base precedes it? What base is you know succeeds it, and so on. Like where, what's the context, and so on. And then you can sort of use those models to suppress error and use that anyway. And there is actually companies that are starting to do that uh, from from that perspective as well. Not going at with this average fragment, so I guess that, that's what intrigues me is whether you know combine and get that extra you know, power. Out. I haven't seen a lot of that coupling yet, and this is where the field being ripe for application 
i.e. commercialization, makes it a little bit more challenging, I think. And this is where, you know, if you're a company trying to do this, you are in an IP minefield, right? And and so maybe academic groups like ours can actually do this faster in our data and, and demonstrate the potential. But I haven't seen a lot of that combined yet uh, in literature. Any other questions? Thank you.